Can I remember everyone? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, keynote um, panel. Uh, we're delighted to have you all here from around the world. Uh, my name is Paul Stacey and with us is an excellent panel that our colleague and friend at eCampus Ontario, Chris Fernland, has organized. So Chris, why don't I turn it over to you and you can introduce everyone and get things underway. Sure, sounds great. Thank you, Paul. Alrighty, let's get started. So my name is Chris Fernland and I'm the manager of student support at eCampus Ontario, where I support the Student Experience Design Lab or SXD Lab for short. I wanted to make a quick land acknowledgement, if that's all right. I mean, I know we're all joining virtually, but I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. And personally, the lands of the peoples of the Mississaugas of the Scubog Island First Nation, where I'm joining from right now. I'm actually kind of on a reserve, which is really cool. I mean, as a settler, I'm grateful to have been welcomed on this land in early childhood and to have been given the opportunity to grow up here with family and friends. So please join me in acknowledging our shared responsibility to improve understandings of local Indigenous peoples and cultures. So today, thanks to Paul and Alan and everyone at OE Global, I have the privilege of introducing a wonderful panel of students studying in Ontario that are relatively new to the world of open. I mean, for me personally, open is a big concept that offers a lot of value for post-secondary education. I mean, I live and breathe this stuff almost every day and have the privilege of working with communities who regularly engage with open concepts. But for today's conversation, we really wanted to take a step backwards, I guess, and remind ourselves that not everyone has drunk the open Kool-Aid. And, and as some of my colleagues like to say, there are sharks in open waters and there's a sense of conviction, I guess, held by many open connoisseurs, if I can call them that, that can, from my perspective, make it challenging for articulating the value of open. And the reality is, is that open can be a steep learning curve. And too many of us, myself included, take a stance that if you're not with us, then you're my enemy. That's right, I just made a Star Wars reference at <laughs> 9 in Toronto. So for today, we wanna to highlight the voice of students and leverage their fresh perspectives. with The goal really of highlighting that not everyone understands and perceives open like some of the experts do, and especially those that are new to the ether of open. So let's hear from students about what open means to them and what they think about open pedagogy or being engaged as a co-creator of education. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Shamal Gormash from Centennial College. Don't mind raising your hand, Shamal, thank you. She is studying hospitality and tourism. And interestingly, Shamal is an international student from Turkey. And she works with us in the SXD lab here in Ontario. Also with us is Malik Abu Rabia from Laurentian University up in Northern Ontario, who is pursuing a Bachelor of Business admin and also holds the title of Vice President of Education for the Laurentian University Student Association. Last but not least, we have Ali Kazmi, who recently graduated from the University of Toronto with a degree in history and poli sci. He serves as a graduate research assistant for OCAD University and also works with us in the SXD lab. We were supposed to be joined by one other student, Brad Delgish, but for personal reasons, unfortunately, he's unable to join us. So we'll just continue with the three, three panel students. All right. Thank you, Malik, Shamal, and Ali for joining us today. Let's kickstart the conversation. So I know we've talked a little bit offline about open, but when, and, and again, you, you have admitted that you are sort of, you know, new to the space of, of open education and, and all things open. But when you hear really the words open education or open pedagogy or open educational resources, but mainly open broadly, like what comes to mind for you? I can start. So one of one of the 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 things that comes to me is about participatory learning and technology. So what I mean by by that is is that I would say that just having um, disposable um, quizzes or you know wh where the the audience is only the TA or the professor. And if you may perhaps do an essay or, or you do some lab or some lab and it's tossed out, I think that that is something which um, 
speaking as a history student is going paper after paper, topic after topic, without any real carryover personally, now that I'm working in such a different field, namely micro credentials. Um, so one of the things that, that, that strikes me is that having either some sort of either a capstone project where, you know, one of the things that when I speak to master's students or some of the other experts in, in my field is that all of the work they, that they did throughout their, 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 their time in school is that they could carry it forward like some sort of like a Bible, right? So that they can go around and share their work with different workplaces, with all sorts of people. And it didn't just stay in one place. It actually, it helped them find out their 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 path in life and just that's just the 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 first thing that that comes to mind for me so you really want your assignments and the work and effort and energy you put into learning assets to be meaningful to have purpose and to you know contribute to a greater good thank you ali for sharing that's that's really really cool to hear jamal or malik do you want to shed some light yeah on? I, I think just to add to Ali's point, I, I really see it as the evolution of, of post-secondary education in general. So I think there's just been a really big debate over a long time about, you know, why do I need this education when I can just learn this all on my own? But then there's another conversation of, well, if I do that, then I won't get recognized for all the work I've done to learn. Um, maybe even just to give a, an example of a professional development even. So I was fortunate enough to work at, a, at, a, at an autonomous mining company and I know nothing of AI. So I decided to do a lot of uh, research online. One, I had no idea even where to go. So just having a platform where, um, where it's really simple to just find a lot of educational resources on the fact and then have it recognized that, oh yes, you did do it. Here's accreditation or recognition for your effort. I think it just really shows that there, there's an unlimited amount of things you can learn and. And I feel like education before this was really a professor holds your hand, reads the slides. And after that, you know, everything's on your own and there's no recognition. So I think that it's really great that, um, that it really empowers learning and, and removes a lot of accessibility barriers uh, to get into post-secondary education. So I really see it as a, as a really great resource that has so much potential. Um, not just for, for students um, enrolled in a university, but for lifelong learners, which uh, hopefully I will be after my, my uh, undergrad, so. Definitely, I mean, open is a great concept to leverage that sort of goal to be a lifelong learner for sure. Malik, I'm really curious before I pass it over to Chanel. I mean, have you, do you think that open educational resources specifically are prominent among Laurentian University? I don't think it's a conversation that's really been addressed as much as it should be. I think even just before you brought it to my attention, I was like, wow, like I really wish we had that because I find that a lot of courses is really, you know, one textbook, you read the slides and profess I find like professors have so much knowledge outside of the textbook. And, and I think a lot of students really want to see that. Like we, we really are interested in what this professor really thinks. And, I, and, I, and if OERs were really um, uh, really taken advantage of in the classroom, I, I think we could just really see more exciting lectures in general and one where students can really retain information, enjoy what they're learning and get involved in that process as well, instead of just being sort of fed information without having that back and forth, which is especially challenging in an online format. Absolutely. Thank you very much for sharing, Malik. I'm very curious to hear from Shamal from the college side of things in Ontario. Um, I guess uh, Malik and Ali already said um, a very important part of what OE is. Uh, to sum up what they just said, I think in short, I would say when, it, when we talk about OE or open education, what comes to my mind on the top of my head is flexibility and inclusivity, which are maybe two of the most important components for a good quality education experience. I talk about flexibility and inclusivity because uh, like Malik was saying, in post-secondary, we're not really uh, being informed about uh, other pathways to receive a quality education other than just, you know, 
go to a college, listen to the slides, and then you're all alone, do some uh, assignments, and then here's your midterm, good luck, you know? Um, this tend to happen. Um, so that's why I think there needs to be a lot of flexibility to um, make room for each type of student in education, especially in post-secondary. And OE is a type of resource that can provide that. And also uh, with inclusivity comes like many other topics such as, you know, uh, financial stability or like sociocultural elements. So um, OE is also a resource that can help uh, overcome these barriers as well. So it's really, really critical for a quality education. The words that are coming to mind upon saying that is really freeing up the learning, freeing up education. And thank you very much for sharing. So I'm sure everyone has heard a thing or two about this whole global pandemic thing that's striking us still. I mean, obviously there's been massive global disruption that frankly has directed everyone's experience, you know, impacted your experience as a post-secondary learner. But like, what can you share with us so far about your experiences and how do you think an approach such as open pedagogy can support your, I guess, shift to online learning and, and other students shifts to remote teaching and learning? Um, if I may. Um, yeah. So I think it absolutely has been a challenging shift at first. Uh, when this all happened in March, we were all like, oh my God, what's happening right now? Like, I don't know how else to like study because online learning was a part of our lives to an extent. But like for me personally, I only had one online class before the shift to online education in general. So there were some gaps that needed to be filled. Uh, some post-secondary educations were like really good with that, uh, creating like consistent uh, curriculums and, you know, utilizing as much technological platforms as possible to make it as easy as possible for all kinds of students. Um, but at the same time, I realized that during that whole like quarantine period before school started, uh, I realized that I was like uh, taking advantage of OE already without actually like knowing what the concept is uh, because in that time people needed like something to go with right because um, it was just a weird time like especially with like no school or like um, no other things to like keep yourself busy you need some sort of um, uh, like element to sort of like push you to your best self, I guess, to have you like feel more motivated. And with that, I was able to like learn about new courses that um, I wasn't interested before. And with that, I was able to find a lot of online uh, education resources, um, open education resources, sorry, <laughs> um, that, that helped me sort of like start my OE uh, journey myself without even knowing what OE is actually. And now that we're talking about this, it's sort of like interesting for me that like not a lot of people are aware of uh, what kind of like gem is OE is. And uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. That's really cool to hear actually that you were engaging with open stuff without even really realizing, I guess, like the massive global movement, such as Open Education Global. <laughs> it's very cool. Ali, do you want to shine a light on that question? Yeah. So one of the first year students I was speaking to recently, she was, she, she was also in a history program. And what she was telling me was that because there was so much um, inconsistency with how courses were being prepared, where we do have some, some, um, some courses where you might need to, to download three different platforms for your book. So Kobo Books or some other, like all of these different book platforms just to get access to something which um, could not be sourced because of this uh, transition. And when that happens, that can actually take so, like like that can actually stop that that student from taking you know a particular course seriously. And then it leads to all of these cascading sorts of things where they you know they find that they're not getting dressed, they're not showing up on on camera. They might just be focusing on some other, some other courses. And then what she was saying was is that now like there's so much more incentive to go and find my own sources and my own resources to help 
push this course forward because you know if i'm waiting on the the store to you know say that a book is in stock even though it's it's digital for some reason there's some hold up there and that can just really you know throw students off and that's one of the things that i i recall about that so that that is one point and the other point that what i found that during this tran the transition period is that whereas before if you're a student and you're walking through through campus and you might you know by chance come across a student booth or some sort of promo booth for a particular service which, which you would not have known about now that everything has moved online now there's this sort of like you know there's this this like clash of all of these all of these these different terms and like and like models which students didn't really consider before such as the future of work right so now that you know that they have to network online and use linkedin more and now they're coming across many more different like sources of forecasting now there is that that sense that i have to be much more intentional with my learning right so now there so that's where this, this this comes into play where it's much more, like so like just how you spend your time is much more important because time management especially uh, these days it's, it's it's quite difficult so that's one thing also i'm seeing as well thank you very much for sharing i love what you said there paul about providing a direct source of oer for students and i've actually heard of scenarios in, in student advocacy world in ontario where you know, students pointed faculty to an OER and kind of put pressure on them to adopt and or adapt the OER. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Thank you, Ali, for sharing that. Malik. Yeah, so maybe just to give an Ontario perspective. So right now we're actually um, doing an, a, a student survey across the province. And I think just from the early data that we're collecting now is that there's a really big dissatisfaction in our post-secondary education across, across the province. And I think there's a, obviously, uh, Chris, maybe we actually talked about this yesterday in our meeting. Uh, you, you consider the transition from like the pandemic uh, to online learning, not uh, online delivery, but emergency delivery. So I, I, I really agree with that. It, it's, it was very rushed. And I think st a lot of students fell uh, in the cracks um, with uh, different teaching styles and and I think that a lot of the times, the reason why a lot of faculty don't push OERs is because, you know, they want to sell their own textbook or et cetera, but students really are not buying. I, I remember even the first week of, of class, everyone was sharing the PDF version of the textbook in the Zoom chat during the lecture. So I, I think that, I, I think there's a lot of, of just hunger for, for open education and, and really um, having I, I, I really believe that education will, will never be the same post pandemic than previously, but I think there's just so much clinging to that old way of doing things that it's really not benefiting students at its current form. Um, so really with that, um, there, there, need, there really does need to be a, a big push, uh, be, you know, whether it is through faculty or, or given to students directly, as Paul mentioned, I think a, a bigger awareness uh, and a bigger push uh, would really be helpful because the data does show that, that how it works now is, is not working for our student body. Thank you for saying all that. That's the perfect segue into a directional question that I really want to ask. And, and I know we've discussed offline that open is a, a new concept for you all, but I mean, you've all been quite receptive, and encouraging of open education and, and open pedagogy and, and obviously open educational resources specifically. But given your emergent or emerging knowledge of open, like how can we bring others into the fold? I'm really thinking about your first impressions. I mean, open, the value of open can initially be a steep learning curve. So, so given your first impressions, like how might we articulate and persuade educators and other learning professionals or anyone really that open has value. So how might we bring others into the fold? Maybe I can start this one with this one. So uh, continuing, yeah. So um, continuing uh, conferences like this, first of all, is amazing. Con spreading awareness on the global level is, is amazing. Like, uh, I just want to say that first of all, but 
I think that there's still a lot of faculty that are still not even there with technology in general, uh, at least in the Northern perspective here, there's some people, there's some professors that still are not getting the idea of Zoom. So I think that that going and, and continuing workshops and, and I think IT support will be huge, will be really needed. And I think just a lot of academic workshops uh, with these institutions uh, at the, um, at, at different levels so that um, it becomes more consistent as well with the way it's used and not, um, not saying, oh yeah, I'm just gonna use this little tiny thing and I'm not gonna let students do anything else. So I, I think there just really needs to be uh, faculty training, even student training, because you know, with everything, with our core course load already, some students may say, I'm just gonna look at the slides and not worry about it. I think that there just needs to be a lot more awareness and, and training on, on all levels. Um, just to get everyone up to speed and on the same level, because you know it may seem very daunting at the moment, but once it's explained to you and everything like that, then you know I think that that's a really big shift. That might be a broad answer, but I think that's the best one I have uh, to date. I couldn't agree more, Malik. Thank you for sharing that perspective, Shamali. Would you like to go next? Yeah. Um, so I have to agree with you, Chris, uh, before I uh, talk about my opinion on how steep of a curve uh, that transition to OE can be, because like Malik was talking about, um, there is this tendency to sort of like still stick with like the old or like traditional methods of learning. And I understand that it can be uh, challenging for students to sort of like transition to like uh, learning with self-discipline in like in like the forefront of your you know learning experience because with OE comes uh, a really big like uh, responsibility for like you to like keep yourself in check um, but at the same time uh, I think other than just you know partnering with post-secondary institutions there can be other direct ways to reach out to students because I also have to agree with Malik uh, with um, uh, post-secondary institutions want to sell their own books they the the books that they like that's the harsh truth I think but like they're like sort of there to sell those books to make some sort of profit because that's that tend to how it works but at the same time they're like OE um, uh, resources can find ways to reach out to um, students directly uh, be it online platforms, be it, you know, partnering with even like local libraries to sort of like bring these uh, resources to like light, um, bring those resources to, uh, to be more accessible with, you know, providing uh, partnerships with like different institutions that necessarily doesn't have to be post-secondary institutions. So I think um, looking at different ways to, you know, reach out to students instead of uh, their institutions could be a great start to sort of like encourage students to sort of um, advocate for it. And then um, once students are pretty much a lot more aware of this, then institutions can make uh, better changes too. Amazing. So great to hear you share that perspective, actually. Thank you for sharing, Shamal. Ali. If you want to comment, yeah. If we're talking about trying to uh, shift perspectives with with regard to schools, I would say that you know sticking to to the basics, like so, having some sort of small advisory board, perhaps you know taking in you know student members and student perspectives at the inter departmental and discipline disciplinary level and then you know just like pick like a a few items to like use test and then from there uh you know prepare some sort of you know prototype or some sort of presentation which can then be taken to the you know either it could be a vice provost office or something like that and then you know hopefully small changes will happen over time rather than expecting some quick radical change which will you know satisfy everyone which has been my experience at u of t you know uh, when we when we used to work for making our convocation ceremony ceremonies more accessible the, these processes take time yes i can totally relate to that institutions can sometimes be slow moving ships but 
I mean, change can be infectious, especially uh, change or, or a concept such as open, at least for what I've seen. It's just, it's, it is a steep learning curve, as you guys have mentioned, to really come to terms and come to grip with understanding like the value of open. So, so thank you guys for sharing. Seeing some questions or a question in the chat from Lena, great. Uh, Lena, question, if your teacher asked you to be a collaborator in your learning experience, what would that look like? What form might it take? It's a great question. Thank you so much, Lena. I mean, I wanted to quickly say too, like the bread and butter of the eCampus Ontario Student Experience Design Lab is to meaningfully include and engage students with the design and operation of the Ontario higher education system that ultimately exists to serve students. And we wholeheartedly believe that by engaging students as co-creators of knowledge or curriculum or delivery methods, et cetera, then an educator's journey to educate and a learner's journey to learn will be much easier and more conducive to that sort of end user experience. So assuming you were afforded such an opportunity, like what would an ideal open partnership between your faculty and you as a student look like? Like how do you imagine yourself as a colleague or a contributor to your own educational experiences as Lena's asking? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really great question. Uh, I, I actually never really uh, considered that one before, but I think in general, when students are paying tuition like this, I, I think, at least for me, uh, you know, I, I really want to say in my education, I think that there's a really big demand of students really wanting to have a seat at the table and, and get an, an understanding of, of that. And I, I think there's already a lot of, of cases where, you know, uh, different departments and faculty committees already have student seats. And I think that um, one, including more student seats within those already existing committees, but then having subcommittees within those departments and faculties to address these specific academic concerns, I think would already be a, a pretty easy first step to start because that's at a lot of institutions or there are already students at the table. Um, but again, I think Ali really mentioned again, like that, that there should be advisory boards and, and should be committees already uh, at, at the administrative level at a, lot, at a lot of institutions. So I think continuing or following that and, and, and just being very conscious about, uh, about um, student involvement in those decisions is really important. I think choosing, choosing uh, personally, I feel like discussions like this is I've learned more in discussions like this than, than anywhere I possibly could. And I think continuing these conversations at the institution level is so beneficial. And having and making it so that the classroom is not only controlled by the professor, but also had a say by, by students, I think would really be beneficial. Yeah, and um, to touch on what Malik just said, I think um, apart from a faculty-wide uh, committees, which uh, I agree should already be in place, um, apart from that, I think students also should have a say in um, like how the how a particular class uh, goes. You know, like um, while the class is going, there still should be opportunities to like make changes to the course outline. Um, talk about the assignments, talk about how much they are worth, and sort of like decide uh, what is important, what, what type of deliverables are the most important for a student with the students, because uh, instructors tend to sort of um, uh, like, I guess, like create their own course outlines that sometimes tend to not align with what students might need. And because of that, uh, that like outline should be open to changes over the course of the entire semester or like the entire duration of that course being taught. And that can be achieved really easily. You don't really need like a committee for that, but it can be like a, a survey that can be like attached to the, um, to the course shell on like the learning management system, such as Brightspace that we use. Um, so like simple surveys like that every other time uh, before or after class to talk about like where this class is going and how uh, like the instructor or the faculty can improve this and what should not be done anymore and what should be like done from now on, et cetera, et cetera. So questions like these while the class is still going is very, very important to sort of like decide what students value the most, I think. 
You're speaking my language for my personal preferences for education. I mean, flexibility should be front and center and, and education should be iterative from my perspective, especially curriculum. I mean, students learn in very different ways and, and appreciate different options for multiple forms of delivery. And one size doesn't fit all, I think. And that's, that's really, really cool that you say that. Ali. Uh, so yeah, just to uh, keep going on that uh, multiple forms of presentation, one of my fondest memories from, from uh, last year at, at U of T was one course called the Politics and Culture of Scandinavia. And now one of the great things about that course and with how, vi with how visionary that, that professor was, was that we could actually go in and interact with the source. So whether that's we go and see, we, we, we actually go to a Danish arch architecture firm, or we actually get to speak to the Swedish ambassador to, to Canada at the Monk School, or, and all, all of these different things. Now, one of the ways that you could make this sort of um, uh, course plan more open is that perhaps the, the class itself, depending on its size, could recommend certain trips. Now, obviously, in, the, in, in, in these days of the, the pandemic, it's much trickier, but that's one of, that's one of the ways that, you know, just ha having a student say in the, in the trajectory and the pit stops of a particular course, Thank you. I almost wonder. Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I I almost wonder if like uh, so in in the summer there's this time period of between the time you register for courses and the start of the first semester. I I almost wonder because I feel like faculty will will say you know what about the syllabus? I need to have that ready, etc. If there was a an availability to have um, you know to to uh, send out an email to students in the summer, say hey guys. Um, if you want to join my committee in the summer when you're probably prepping for school anyway, maybe if you would like to have a say and maybe we can explore these opportunities before giving a syllabus to the entire class. Uh, I wonder if, uh, if that would be a great uh, way to just to not even to, to even just to relieve stress uh, on students already having a big workload within the semester and then uh, faculty worrying about um, about those syllabus as well. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea because like uh you start paying for the school in summer and then a couple months later you just start and you're like surprise i don't know anything here like i just know the names of the courses and like i have no idea what's going to happen now um so i think that's definitely a great idea to sort of like kick start that process even before the 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 school starts to sort of like um not only prepare students for like what's coming but also uh give them a voice and what needs to come i guess yeah that's amazing okay. do you want to add anything at all very well said though everyone i'm going to pull some other questions from the chat here uh, another question, do you guys notice that the emergency remote teaching, does it encourage teachers to learn about the possibilities of OER or are they just trying to keep up with their old ways of sheets and monologues? I guess uh, to expand on that question or sort of simplify the question, I mean, have you heard of echoes of faculty members that are potentially, you know, open to the idea of open? Have you heard anything with, within your networks at all? Not really, I'm gonna have to say because um, like while most of my professors personally are not like looking forward to like go back to like to the old way completely of teaching, uh, but they're still making us buy textbooks uh, and they're still um, putting up uh, documents that are not um, like that don't have any like creative commons li uh, licenses or anything like that. Uh, there is no information for us that can be like reused or remixed or um, any other types of flexible information for us. And we still like, even everything is online, we still have to go and buy a textbook, whether it is like a physical copy or um, um, a digital copy. Uh, we're still not provided um, uh, like other ways of getting the same type of education or the same amount of knowledge. And that sort of 
that's interesting because um, I feel like faculty should be more and more aware of OER because it's not something that just helps the student, but it also gives the, the instructors a unique voice when they're um, explaining the, the whatever topic is, that is being talked about because they're able to put their own voices into uh, the OER and from there it like that can grow to become a much better um, piece of knowledge than like those textbooks that we're paying for. Thank you, very well said, Shamal. I wanna potentially, before I pass it over to, to Ali or Malik, I wanna potentially solicit questions from faculty or, or anyone on, on the call right now who may not be you know, plugged in in the open ether and, and might just be kind of warming up to the idea of open. I'd love to hear from some of your concerns and or questions or, or things that you're kind of coming to terms with or coming to grip with uh, as you consider you know, working with open concepts or open educational resources or meaningfully including students. Just wanna plant that seed for later if you guys wanna sort of ask questions there. Malik, do you wanna jump back to that? Yeah. You can ask it again if you need it. Oh, it's okay. Uh, so I think just in terms of remote remote delivery, I, I really can't expect a fundamental change in the month that faculty had to switch from in person to online. So I, I really did not expect a ton of fundamental change there. But I, I think now, as things are sort of becoming more normal, it's been a year since the since COVID nineteen became a thing. Um, but uh, so I, I think right now is a time where we can now spread awareness through uh, through conferences like this. And and now I, I believe that a lot more faculty are becoming more open to the idea as we now know that this is not going to be something that just ends and we're back to where we were in 2019. So I think now that that reality is more or less settling in, there'll be a lot more faculty are becoming more open to that idea, but still um, but it's still very hard with the sort of capitalization of post-secondary education. It's, it's even for students, it's sort of hard to believe. It's too good to be true a lot of the time, you know, when something is free and you get credits for it, it's like, oh, what? So I think that once those fundamental ideas become, um, become more uh, mainstream, I think around conver with conversations like this, for example, uh, then I believe that we can really uh, uh, push on from there. But, yeah, but did, that I really think that things were going to be, you know, from like a faculty member with 20 years of experience was going to go from that to something completely different within a month. I probably not, but I, I think now now is a really good time to to start thinking about that a little bit more. I truly appreciate your empathy here and understanding, Malik. I mean, from my perspective, if I was a student now, I'd just be screaming open left and right across the campuses. So I really appreciate your understanding there. Ali, do you want to comment on the question in, in chat? Uh, so just to quickly reflect on the previous question. So, and again, a, a common theme that I'm seeing from talking to students is that because of the presumption that students now have more time since they are at home, either the workload stays the same or it increases and just, and then their stresses, they, they also uh, cascade. So, and so that's one of the things is, is that now that we might, that in the coming months we'll be shifting towards a hybrid model is that how can professors and TAs sort of, um, adjust their 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 attitudes and their teaching methods for both um, the the in-person class or the asynchronous class and have 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 empathy for both of, of those populations now one of the the questions I'm just seeing in the in the chat from Christina is that um, just going back to the K, the K to 12 years, what might open education have looked like there? How can OEG, OEG advocate for open, uh, open, open education in K to 12? One of the things that, uh, it's been a while since I've been in K to 12, but when I was in high school, I was in high school after they had removed it in Ontario the old grade thirteen. Now, one one thing that that you that you do see, especially in um, post secondary uh, um, like programs, is that in your senior years, is that you can essentially build your own course. Now, I'm of the personal opinion that 
high school does not really prepare you for the next step in in some cases and also based on on your program so having that sort of grade 13 or having an extra an extra year to really you know um work with what you've gained and like get a sense of your transferable skills and see how that feeds into where you want to go for post-secondary do you want to go to um post-secondary. That's something which is sort of missing from this conversation about, and I'm, I'm really glad that we're also focusing on not just the university experience, but what comes before that. Very, very well said. Thank you for pulling that question in the chat. I want to also pull another question. I, I swear I'll get to the other questions as well in the chat. There's lots of really good activity here, which is great, but I wanted to pull from a question from Paul Stacy about that's relevant for this conversation. It is how would you change the capitalization of education if you were in full control of the beast of post-secondary in Ontario? I, I think um, I think really that revolves around public funding. So even 15 years ago, student tuition really only made up for maybe 15, 10% of a university's budget. Now it's a little more than half. I think those numbers are really concerning and there's so much more pressure for students to pay higher and higher tuition and international students are facing that by sometimes paying up to five times more than domestic students. And I think that there just needs to be more of a, of a national and sort of like provincial, at least for Canada province, but, um, but sort of that understanding that education is really the, is, is really such a, investment to the future workforce of that area that I, I think that it, it should not be up it should not have to go to um, you know increase student increasing student debt and increasing capitalism in, in an education in a post-secondary education the same way that most secondary education is not um, private either It's so hard for me not to praise everything you guys are all saying. <laughs> Shamal, do you want to comment? Um, I think um, it's, it's a very tricky question to sort of like find answers to because it's a big topic um, and it affects so many other aspects of what education can bring to your life. Um, but I think public funding is the number one key. I have to agree with Malik here. Um, other than that, at this moment, I can't really think of anything else other than, you know, having public funding for uh, like in order to eliminate uh, high textbook fees, first of all, to sort of like just like create a um, free and open to learn environment because not everybody is able to buy those textbooks and not everybody offers or provides OERs uh, or they don't even um, want to uh, do that because here there was a question in the chat talking about sometimes people tend to think that like because one resource is free it's not very good quality I think that idea should be changed because there's something fundamentally wrong about this in my opinion uh, I from my own experience I realized that faculty and students tend to think that a book is like a higher quality just because it's got some shiny cover and then some like colored photos, some like nice texts, you know, but nobody like nobody really reads the book before deciding on its quality uh, is what I realized. And like if you were to like compare the, the paid resources as well as OERs, I am positive that we would not see that big of a difference uh, while, you know, like uh, textbooks that we pay for might have some more relevant information because they're uh, published uh, a lot late, um, like that, that happens. But at the same time that, like I said, that gives the professor to like create their own voice um, into like, what are, what is it that that's being thought? So I think other than just, you know, like public funding, there needs to be a shift in thinking in terms of how we perceive OER, how we perceive um, cheaper resources, I think. 
I'm so happy you mentioned the quality piece. Very, very well said, because like when I was first being introduced to the concept of open, admittedly, I fell victim to that sort of concern, which I now think is baseless, that, you know, the quality of OER specifically were significantly lower. And I mean, upon actually seeing an actual bound version of a textbook, and it was more than equivalent, especially considering the flexibility and customization, and you know, the options that are afforded with various licenses. So very happy you said that, Shamal. Ali, do you want to comment at all? Yeah, so just just on that last point, again, one of my other fond, fond, fond flashbacks from, from U of T is that uh, I had one poli-sci course where all of the TAs found the, the textbook to be, to be absolute rubbish, and they sort of united against their, their professor of the course who's kind of stuck in his ways. And then for each chapter or for each chop, uh, for each topic, they actually sourced their own uh, uh, research or you know some other better, more comprehensive substitute, substitute over this, this textbook. Now this could all have been, and this actually caused a bit of a slowdown in the course, right? So that, you know, that, so that, you know, they had to make sure that all of the students could actually could actually access those sources. So that's like, it, it's it's one of the things that, is that that can actually happen, right? So, it, and it just, it goes back to that point where, you know, that, you know, that that a fancy textbook by like Norton or or, or, or Pearson or, 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 or whatever is not, it's not always perfect for the needs of a particular class. Never judge a book by its cover. It's <laughs> the first thing that I... So I'm seeing lots of things in the chat about the importance of the student voice with you know, open advocacy broadly. And, and so I wanna pitch a question to you guys, like what do you think, or why do you think many students are, are still not aware of the idea of open educational resources and, and how can open education really draw student interest and engagement? Or how do you think we can draw student interest and engagement? How can um, we spread the word? <laughs> <laughs> you wanna go ahead, Malik? Sure, so I think students are actually already sort of getting an awareness of open education, I think we're already seeing that by the transition from like just online learning and just out of the classroom learning. Uh, I think it's more or less just a, a matter of our institutions not quite knowing and, and not really sure how to advertise it, how to incorporate it themselves. So I think as institutions are figuring it out, they're saying, well, we're not really gonna advertise it if we don't know ourselves. But I, I think students are already sort of getting an idea of or, or even just doubts of the way the system currently works. And, and we've seen that already in, in a ton of discussions already. I think that, I, but I also think that students are really uh, an underutilized resource in a lot of institutions. Even when I think about projects that, are, that would potentially change the way student life works. And I, and I always hear, oh, we don't have a faculty member to work on that. We don't have this or that. And I'm like, you have, a campus of 10,000 students that are, e that are eager to improve the resume and get to work. So I, I always think about these things and, and anytime I, I bring up these points, I just hear faculty going, huh, I wish I thought of that. And then, uh, and then so I, I really think that once institutions get an, aware, an idea that to, to utilize students and that we're really passionate about, about having a say in our education, then I think that would be a lot easier than, than the sort of uh, tension and and uh, and friction uh, with our current discussion. Uh, sure, I'll 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 say something. Um, so one of the things that just just to respond to that question is that it, it also goes back to how students view um, school, right? So is it transactional in nature? Is it a top-down sort of system? Is it um, is it something that they just view as it's just all focused on on grades and do they just see it as a stepping stone and then figure out their life later rather than actually using um, school as a sort of uh, uh, creative foundation for that. Um, one of the, the things that I think back to about what really um, made me invested in in uft was when i actually got to be a part of what made made that school tick right so not just being a student but being an active part participant in making that that school better right so the way i did it was through working with their student accessibility services and working with different 
co-design teams to make different aspects of that school better. Now, if we took it down to the micro level of how can we make a course, how, how can we get students more invested in their, their, their courses, it can go, go back to my, my previous point about them having a say in, you know, what is the trajectory of a particular syllabus? Can there be, you know, if it's a year long course, can there be tentative blocks within that syllabus that beforehand students can have a, a say in? One, uh, one other thing which I've also noticed with how, if we're talking about the, the, the online context is that students, um, they are very proactive in preparing for, you know, tests and finals as a group. They'll always have some sort of shared document, but actually if that shared document, um, you know, or, or, or that sort of format could be, you know, pushed towards some sort of collective capstone project, which then, you know, that, that they could have a stamp of that, that saying that, yes, that this, this competency was, was gained, that, that, that there's, there's some sort of digital credential or some sort of, some sort of evidence that, that they can take with them and not just leave a course behind. Like, like what I was talking about prior that, you know, if it's a topic or if it's a, if it's a paper that not just leaving it in, in your save folder, but actually it's a, it's a, it's, it's a part of you. I'm not even shaking my head. It's just actually amazing to hear these perspectives. Uh, I'm seeing a question in the chat, which I think you just answered, Ali, and that is like, would you have been interested in generating open educational content uh, as a part of your undergraduate studies? And I think I can speak on your behalf, Ali, the answer is yes, you would love to have that freedom to collaborate and work collectively. And that's really getting into some of the concepts we work at eCampus Ontario with student experience design and, you know, focusing on the fact that your work as a faculty member can be enhanced or optimized with having students as contributors and co-creation models. Really, really cool to hear, Ali. Shamal, so uh, the original question was like, I mean, how can we bring more students into the fold and how can we promote more open educational content and awareness among students? Um, being a marketing buff, I think like my head sort of like goes into like the more technical uh, part of this question. Um, I absolutely can vouch for the fact that if enough students were aware of this uh, gem that is OE, um, a lot better changes can be made or um, uh, if students were were able to like access these resources a lot more, um, it would have been a lot better. So I think what like what uh, what it comes down to is I think marketing and how the outreach is being done. Um, outreach is a big component in this sense, I believe, because the way you talk about this this product, the way you um, market it, the way you showcase this to students have a big impact because one way that you can showcase OER is um, you can say, oh, look, there are some cheap resources here that you can use instead of this shiny, bright colored, expensive textbook. And that really is not gonna have like a positive connotation for students when they're thinking about what OER is, they're gonna think of something less of a quality than what school is already providing for them. So I think um, finding new ways for you know, uh, student communication and incorporating student voices into advocating for OER, I think is really, really important. Um, just as we have SXD Lab in eCampus Ontario, uh, certain um, OE institutions can also sort of like maybe try and incorporate some student uh, committees or like advocacy teams that can uh, personally reach out to students instead of um, trying to create some other types of outreach because that personal connection is also what matters to, to students, especially Gen Z, I would say. And yeah, like overall um, better outreach strategies focusing on how we can access students and how we can uh, access marginalized communities. And I think with marginalized communities, um, another fact comes, it's uh, libraries. Um, I was thinking of like how, like if I was a student that was struggling financially, I don't have a space to study, I don't have any resources to study, I don't have an internet connection or a stable internet connection. I don't have a laptop that can support 
what my institution wants me to uh, wants me to do. Um, libraries can actually become like a great pathway for students to sort of like see more possibilities for OER because uh, libraries can definitely partner with these types of resources to sort of like um, offer them to um, to their uh, to their members. I know that Toronto Public Library does this to an extent, but nobody's aware of this because they're not advertising for it. They're not, they don't have a marketing strategy for this. I have to like, um, like go to Toronto Public Library, just like go through all of their um, like websites and see uh, what kind of like educational support they provide to me. So definitely like have you like showcase your product is super, super important, especially for a clientele that is more like youngsters, I would say. <laughs> um, so yeah. Couldn't agree more. I mean, I definitely think libraries is sort of an untapped niche where students can get involved and help sort of with the, the promotion or the curation of educational materials, especially open ones. So that's, that's really a great point. Uh, and, and you're definitely speaking to some of our missions at eCampus Ontario with the SXD Lab is to thoughtfully and, and really proactively include students, you know, with conversations and moving beyond simply tokenism of, you know, we included a student on our advisory board, actually preparing them and ensuring that they're on the same page and can actually engage critically to the same extent as a faculty or educator. And to answer your question, Paul, should every institution have an SXD lab? Yes, definitely. But really, I think it just, they should have a process where they can meaningfully engage students so that they can contribute equally and, and you know, participate and try to optimize their own educational journey and collaboration with faculty. I mean, I personally feel that to be a value. I wanted to get to another question and thank you all for sharing of your suggestions for how we can spread the word with students. But a good question from Alan, and we're talking a lot about open educational resources and open textbooks specifically, but on the theme of sort of this conversation, like freeing up the learning and, and having more collaboration, I mean, Alan's question is, is the textbook always essential? I mean, have you ever had courses that were not reliant on one? Like, is, have, you, have you guys have ever heard of an opportunity or experienced a course where, you know, content was not sort of put into one little book, but actually spread in other ways? Um, yeah, for the most part of my classes studying tourism, I don't have textbooks for the past year, I would say. Um, at, like my first year, we had some textbooks, but um, right now, um, most of my professors want to go with case studies and like actual published reports rather than, you know, theoretical knowledge. But I think the fact that I'm not using textbook is also has to do with like my profession being a very hands-on practical one. Um, I wouldn't be able to have a say in like, say like engineering or any other um, type of um, more like theoretical discussions. Uh, but even so, there still can be uh, resources that, that that are not textbooks that can uh, highly elevate uh, the learning experience. Um, like Ali was mentioning for one of his uh, history classes, they were going to like certain uh, activities or like certain um, destinations to learn more about the history um, of Scandinavians and their culture. And that can be done with many other things. Like instead of having a textbook, um, institutions or instructors can partner with like an industry professional and have them come to uh, their class for a session and that is like absolutely a lot better than a textbook in every single way uh, like an industry professional who's good at what they're doing whose experience is definitely going to provide a more meaningful and purposeful information than any other textbook that you can purchase so it's absolutely never necessary to have textbooks no, like I see I'll be, the, yeah. yeah, I'll be cautious of time, but I think I'm very guilty in the fact that I buy textbooks and I never open them. I think I refer to Google more than anything to learn about terms and I just look at articles, but I think there's also another conversation about international knowledge and, and me specifically, I'm very, I'm very, um, I like to be aware of different perspectives and, and I think that a lot of the times textbooks are a lack perspective and, um, and I really like 
I re I'm a firm believer in international education and the world's getting so much smaller, but that's not being shown in our classrooms, although uh, students are, but the content may not. So I, I really think that, um, that um, open education really opens barriers to um, international collaboration like this conference, for example. So I, I really think that it has a really good role to play in, in decolonization and, and having different perspectives in our, in our classrooms, not only from the professor, but from the content that professor um, presents. Thank you for saying. I think it really summarizes a lot of the conversations we're having, which is really about the democratization of knowledge. And I mean, I personally believe the spread of knowledge amongst people is critical, not just privileged elites. I mean, ought to be the focus, especially in a publicly funded system. And in libraries, for sure, in particular, public libraries and modern digital technology, such as the internet, play a key role in opening up access. Ali, I'm so sorry, you probably want to say some things because you're super smart and know a lot about these concepts, but I'm looking at the timer and there is nine seconds left. So I wanted to take this time to thank everyone for joining today and thank the panelists for you know, taking time of your day to share your perspectives. And I mean, we need more students like you who have this, I guess, drive to want to improve the educational system and, and to promote things that open and really spread the value. And, so thank you all for, for sharing your perspectives and really great to hear from you guys. Thanks, Paul, for the invitation to talk about some of these things. So fantastic. We could uh, keep this one going for hours, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you to. all. Thank you all. It's really been fantastic. I, 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 and I can see the, the questions just keep on rolling. So uh, thank you all, uh, especially Malik, Samal, and Ali. Uh, and Chris for organizing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And you can hear the interest from all of the participants. And so I think we're on the cusp of kind of evolving and moving towards a more open education approach. And I really feel like um, you guys are going to be enablers. So thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank Paul. You very much.